and welcome to Quincy Votes, the primary election night coverage here on Quincy Access Television. I'm joined by my colleague, Joe Catalano. Joe, uh, welcome. Mark, nice to uh, virtually see you in this uh, pandemic world election that we're covering. A lot of firsts happening uh, here uh, at QATV and here across the country during this election. Certainly, I had the opportunity, and folks will see at the end of the evening, to chat with City Clerk Nicole Crispo, and uh, the piece was called At the Polls, but we weren't at the polls. That's right. We should let folks know that uh, we will not be able to bring uh, numbers uh, to you this evening as we normally do. We have our volunteers typically spread out at 31 precincts all across the city, uh, but due to the pandemic and also due to the uh, large amount of mail-in ballots that were received. Uh, we won't be able to bring you numbers um, this evening, but we do have uh, a lengthy list of, of candidates that are on the ballot that we'll be speaking with throughout the evening. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's the one part of Quincy Access Television's coverage that uh, people will get to see. Uh, certainly speaking with uh, Nicole earlier today, it was around 2 p.m. that we did the interview. She uh, basically said that um, everything was going fine. Actually, numbers were up. Overall, she expects uh, quite a large turnout when you count uh, the early voting, the uh, mail ballots, and a beautiful day, absolutely gorgeous day today to get out to vote. Yes, plus the, the absentees that were cast uh, as of yesterday. I think Nicole mentioned there were almost 15,000 requests for mail-in ballots. About 9,000 of them were returned. Um, so it's obviously quite uh, successful. Lots of folks taking advantage of that. And that'll be offered again for the November 3rd uh, general election um, as well. And of course, the viewers will know, you at home will know, that uh, Quincy Access Television hosted messages from the candidates this year, as we have in years past. And uh, Joe, that was uh, quite a success. A lot of uh, candidates came out to uh, basically tell us why they were running or running for re-election or running for the first time. Yes, and again, all done uh, virtually, you know, again, due to the pandemic, we weren't able to have folks into the studio, but about, I think, almost 30 of them took advantage of that opportunity to get their messages out. It worked, as we're doing here tonight um, as well. A lot of firsts here at QATV, so first uh, remote coverage of an election. Also, a first time, I believe, that we've streamed live election coverage, both on our websites, uh, on YouTube, and on Facebook um, as well. This is all new. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, as, as times change or uh, situations exist, certainly COVID-19, uh, one needs to adapt. No question. And we'll be hearing uh, again from candidates in the uh, Dover County races, uh, as well as, believe it or not, a candidate in the U.S. Senate race. There is a Republican primary that a lot of folks might not be aware of for the U.S. Senate race and uh, in the 8th Congressional uh, districts uh, right here in Quincy under the South Shore. We'll be hearing from both Democratic candidates this evening as well. What would you say uh, to folks that, um, well, I, I guess you know, before we get there and, and continue, I believe uh, we do have a guest that is joining us right now. It's, of course, Quincy Mayor Thomas Koch. Mr. Koch, Mayor Koch, welcome. Good evening. Good to see you both. Great to see you. Nice to see you, Mayor. Always a pleasure. Joe, I always hear the voice, but it's nice to see the face once in a while. Appreciate that. I actually had to put on a suit and tie for this. It's nice to see Impressive. you. Mayor, as you curious, were, oh, go ahead, Joe. I was curious, uh, as, a, as a student of government, um, to get your kind of take on on the way this this election pandemic election has gone so far. And I was struck today, I thought back to uh, September 11th, 2001, when there was also um, a primary election uh, during a terrorist attack. Obviously, we're under attack by a, a different enemy, this time the COVID-19 virus, but the de democratic process uh, continues. Amen to that, uh, and thankfully for that. Uh, I, I have observed and have talked to the city clerk a number of times, and her team's done an incredible job dealing with this because we're there's over 10,000 pieces of mail that come in in the early voting. You have the absentee voting, and then of course the early uh, early voting, and then of course election day today, or primary day, I should say. Um, so first of all, my hats off to Nicole, Joe Newton, and the entire election team. I think our results will be quick and clean tonight, Betty, to what I've observed. And I also give my hats off to Bill Harris, the postmaster from Quincy, who uh, 
is also making sure that all the postal runs have been effective, efficient, uh, and quick. So um, thanks to all involved to make it happen. It's been a, it's a different year for sure in so many ways. And, uh, you know, we obviously want to encourage people to vote. Uh, I, I think this was a, a nice gesture for people. Um, although I went to my precinct to vote, I still like to go down and fill out the ballot and put it in the box myself. And some of the people that are doing the mail-in were probably out the supermarket the day before. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it probably helped tick up uh, the turnout. I think it's going to be higher than what they had thought about just a few months ago. And of course, we have a lot of Quincy candidates on the ballot, too, that also feeds the turnout here in Quincy. Mayor, how has the city been doing with the pandemic? I know you've delivered uh, almost daily updates, so that certainly has been helpful for folks. Well, I, I and, and again, um, tip my hats to Ruth Jones, I commission public health, who's just been absolutely extraordinary with, with her commitment and nights and weekends, nonstop, dealing on a regular basis with our other health agencies and Manhattan Health, Cynthia Sierra and that crew, police and fire first responders. I mean, if, if you go back a few months when this thing broke, we didn't know what was going on as far as how the virus would be transmitted. Uh, you know, there was, in fact, they told you early on, don't wear masks. Uh, that's not the appropriate thing to do. You heard early on that the heat was going to kill this, and you see what happened in Arizona or in Florida and Texas. So uh, a lot of, uh, I don't think it was intentional, but a lot of information out there that wasn't accurate. So uh, Ruth and her team done a great job. I appreciate all the work done by all our departments. Uh, we've worked very well with the Chamber of Commerce, Tim Cahill, and, and all the folks in the business world. We've had Zoom calls. We've had updates. Um, and I think the work being done by our community in general is paying dividends because we've seen in some other cities, some, some much higher numbers. Uh, and the state came out with that new map that they're in the red zone, we're in the green. Uh, happy about that. Obviously we wanna be in the white at some point, but for a city of 100,000 being in the green is, is pretty good. Uh, and our numbers have been uh, have been low. I hope they continue to be low. And I'm looking for a few days in a row with a zero new case, that would be ideal. But you know, the, the, the response has been incredible. I, I look at what recreation did this summer, uh, Michelle Hanley and her team. We had recreation programs all summer long. We didn't have one incident, one kid getting sick. And a lot of communities just panicked and canceled the program. Well, that was an important thing for families. Get these kids out, uh, you know, out and about and get them some socialization as well as some exercise. So that was important. Kevin Mulvey, the superintendent of schools and that team working extremely hard on the reopening process. And that's an impossible task to make everybody happy. Uh, back to make some of the people happy, hopefully, uh, more through this. But safety, health and safety is first. I think that's what everybody's cognizant of, and, and we're doing the best we can uh, to get ready for school opening. Can you talk a little bit, Mayor, about uh, the change in, in bus transportation for the public schools due to the pandemic? Yes, we, we moved, the, uh, we moved the, uh, the, the perimeter out, if you will, to two miles rather than one and a half. And uh, essentially, the social distancing requirement on the buses uh, it was impossible for us to meet. We don't have additional buses. In fact, we've been struggling hiring drivers for the existing fleet. Uh, and that's not just unique to Quincy. Uh, oddly enough, the high unemployment rate, yet we have positions available and, and we even train. Uh, so if anybody's out there that's interested in being a bus driver, uh, please reach out to the QPS. But So we went to the school committee voting uh, finally again tomorrow night on it as a policy, go out to the two miles, uh, and then we'll be able to meet uh, the demand uh, and the number is based on what we can, what we're capable of doing. Mayor, appreciate uh, your time this evening, uh, virtually. Uh, hopefully, we can do it uh, in person again very soon. Yes, and I just want to uh, uh, congratulate everybody on the ballot. I, I've always admired people that step forward, put their name on the ballot, go through the process. It's not an easy thing. It's under a lot of scrutiny and criticism. Uh, we have a lot of Quincy candidates on the ballot, and I hope uh, I hope we do well tonight as far as Quincy goes in the county raises. So thank you so much, and uh, stay well, guys. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Mayor. Speaking of those Quincy candidates, uh, we have uh, on the line with us now uh, State Senator John Keenan of uh, Quincy, uh, who is uh, joining us again uh, virtually this evening to talk about his candidacy for re-election. So, Senator, uh, nice to see you. Thanks for spending some time with us tonight. tonight. Are you there, Senator? Hello, how are you? There he is. 
Welcome to uh, QATV's uh, coverage of primary election night. We appreciate you spending some time uh, tonight. How was it out on the campaign trail uh, this year? Uh, it, it's, uh, I have no opposition on Democratic primary ballot, so it's been relatively quiet uh, in, in that respect, but just out doing the normal things and out and about today, uh, there was a lot of interest and excitement uh, relative to today's race, um, the races that were on the ballots. So um, I'm anxious and excited to see what the results are this evening. Talk about, uh, John, what uh, lies ahead, what you've been working on and what you would like to continue to work on. Well, we, we work on a lot of local issues. Obviously, transportation has been a big one. We're you know, making sure that the MBTA is running as, as well as possible. Although that as an issue became uh, less prominent during the pandemic while people were in isolation. Uh, but uh, ridership is picking up again. So that always is a concern, making sure that the buses and the red line are running and that people feel safe on them. Um, the other big issue that we've been working on is trying to figure out our state budget and how that's going to impact our municipalities. We've made a commitment, uh, the legislature and the governor, to fund our cities and towns with local aid at the same level that they were last year. And in some cases, there might be an increase depending on the school formulas. But essentially, we, we've told them that they'll be level funded. And that's going to be a real challenge to us in the legislature and to the governor because our revenues, by some predictions, uh, are going to be about $6 billion short this year compared to last year, unless there's some sort of federal assistance. So we have some real financial challenges ahead of us, and that's going to take up a lot of our time this fall. We extended our formal sessions into the fall to address, for instance, the budget issues, COVID-related issues, and some of the other matters that are pending in conference committees. Another big challenge, uh, speaking of conference committees, John, is uh, the police reform bill. Um, I know that uh, there are vast disparities between the Senate version and the House version. Any update on that? No, they are, they are working. The conference committee, it's three members of the Senate, three members of the House. They're working on it. They're consulting with others. And so hopefully we'll see a bill that is um, one that is reflective of the, the need for reform. And you know, we have to recognize that we do have some of the best police departments uh, in the Commonwealth. And in the Commonwealth, we have some of the best police departments across the country. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. We're very, very fortunate to have a great group of police officers. But uh, the goal of the legislation, at least from my perspective, is to make sure that we stay ahead of everything, that we continue to be uh, the departments that other departments look to, that we have proper training in place, that our hiring procedures across the Commonwealth is standardized, that our training procedures are standardized, that our education procedures are standardized, that our use of force policies are standardized, that uh, we have a licensing or certification and decertification process in place like um, uh, 46 other states, that we have a, a process by which police officers can feel comfortable when they see uh, anything that's out of the ordinary by another police officer, that we move police departments towards accreditation um, right now, we uh, we only have about 100 departments in the Commonwealth that are either certified or accredited, and we want to move that further along. So there's a lot of good things that uh, hopefully will come out of this and will keep our police departments ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, and uh, continue to be recognized as some of the best around. John, just um, taking into account the pandemic, obviously uh, the opioid crisis doesn't rest uh, I know you're on top of legislation that uh, addresses that. It, it has addressed. In fact, the numbers have climbed during the pandemic. And that was highlighted yesterday morning when we had uh, a vigil in Braintree. And then last night, Braintree, Quincy and Weymouth came together for a virtual overdose uh, vigil. And the stories continue to break your heart. And every time you see the pictures of people who have died of overdoses, uh, it's it just... Um, it's just terrible. And I spoke to a, a family yesterday who, who recently lost their son. And the father said to me, I wouldn't want anybody ever to have to feel the pain and the anguish that we've felt. And it really gives you a sense of how tragic all this is and how much work we still have to do to address this opioid epidemic. John, the governor has committed to funding the um, police, uh, the uh, state education bill, the uh, Student Opportunities Act, um, to the tune of some, I think, $6 million for the city of Quincy. Where's that money going to come from? Well, that goes into um, what I just talked about with, in terms of local aid. At this stage, we are acknowledging that we're not going to be able to fund the STOP Act, um, the Education Reform Act, at the levels that we had hoped. And 
at the levels where there had been agreement between the governor and the legislature. So we are looking to level fund and in using the new formula that some communities may see an increase, although it won't be nearly what they would have had were we able to fund the act uh, as we thought we were back in January and February. So we will, uh, we've made the commitment to, to provide as much money to education as possible. And to, it's gonna be a challenge nonetheless, but uh, we're, we're standing firm on that commitment. Well, Senator Keenan, we wanna thank you for joining us tonight in this uh, new way of, of conducting interviews for yes. election night, but thank you for being a part of this. And thank you, and thank you as always for the coverage that you provide. It, it's outstanding and uh, it, it, it allows people to see what's going on and on election night uh, to feel like they're actually engaged in it at the local level. So great work, I, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John, good to see you. Same here, take care, be well. There is a uh, race, of course, for a register of probate uh, in Norfolk County. There are five candidates uh, running for uh, uh, Norfolk County uh, Register of Probates. That's a uh, seat being given up by uh, Patrick McDermott of Quincy. One of those candidates is uh, Colleen Marie Briarly, and Colleen is a, an attorney in Norwood and is joining us this evening. So, uh, Colleen, thanks so much for spending some time with us here at QETV. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I just came in the door. I ended up in Norwood down at um, where I started kindergarten at the Balch School. <laughs> but how are you doing? We're well, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, tell me a little Thank bit about it, what it was like um, at the at the polls. Um, so we started out early today. My um, we we had a team of about fifty people. And we tried to spread out across the county and moved around. I moved around the most. I started in Brookline. Um, and from there at the, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the school. I'm sorry. Oh, cool. The Coolidge School. And um, from there, I went over to Milton and I went to the Tucker School and then I went to the Senior Center. Those polls were pretty slow, very slow. So from there, I went to uh, Sharon. And, oh, I went to Randolph. That was also super slow. And then Sharon was uh, tons of people and signs and lots of activities. So I ended up spending from 2 to about uh, 7 p.m. there and met a lot of great people all through the day in all the towns. So, yeah, how, oh. how, um, how have other people reported the polls? Well, I spoke actually with uh, the Quincy City Clerk midday, and uh, she said that there was brisk activity at the polls. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had a chance to meet with the rest of my team. I literally just walked in the door. So I'll be uh, eager to hear how how the other polls were from my experience. So that's great. That's great so, to hear. For our viewers, so, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, your background and why you're running for register of probate. Yes, my name is Colleen Briley, and I'm from Norwood, Mass. I'm a um, family trial law attorney, and I have worked um, on behalf of children and families before the juvenile probate courts and the superior court for over 35 years now. First in the capacity as a mental health worker at Taunton State Hospital. Then I worked um, in Brockton as a youth advocate for D kids committed to DYS. I have been a DSS social worker up in Lynn, Mass., uh, went to law school running a private business of a daycare. So I've always worked with children and families. Um, since 1996, I've operated a private practice and I work in all the counties, Plymouth, Bristol, and Norfolk, primarily um, in the probate courts as well as the juvenile courts. So when I saw that uh, Patrick McDermott was leaving the position, I, um, I felt that I, uh, that I could bring a lot of my experience to that and um, make an, an impact in the court. So. Now, one of the things I know you are running on is the accessibility of the court and for yes. the court to be really a problem solver. Yes, that's correct. So, um, okay, yeah. No, go ahead. Did you have a question as to that or? Well, oh, so I was just going to say, um, yeah. Yeah, no, go right ahead. Okay, um, so, yeah. so the probate court is a court that um, many, many people approach. I think it's upwards to 70% of people come to that court seeking help and they cannot uh, afford an attorney. So one of the platforms that I, uh, or one of the, the goals I would have is to uh, greatly increase the lawyer of the day program. 
that would offer everybody approaching that court with the ability to have legal advice, sound legal advice from an attorney that specializes in children and family law. Um, also, um, in the capacity of my job, I um, work with a lot of indigent clients. I'm uh, certified by the Massachusetts Committee for Public Counsel Services, and I represent many clients who um, uh, suffer with disabilities, um, uh, and people that suffer with uh, addiction problems, uh, domestic violence in their homes, um, a lack of resources to, to um, get help for their family. So in, in my uh, career, I have a lot of experience working with agencies that are available. Uh, for example, the um, Grandparents Raising Grandchildren, which is an organization that helps relatives who um, have had to step in to take guardianship of their family, the children in their family. Um, this is a support group that helps They've had to do that because of, uh, say, an opioid um, addiction in the family. DCF is looming, ready to pull the kids from the home, and grandparents are stepping in. So that is an agency that I can connect better to the probate court. There's also One Can Help, which is an organization that helps kids um, who don't have um, access to Chromebooks, computers, backpacks. Um, that's another nonprofit. So these are all programs that um, Dove Domestic Violence ended as an agency that I've also worked with on behalf of clients. So um, interpreter services, I work with many clients who are um, do not speak English and uh, the courts obligated under law to provide interpreters. But I feel that, um, especially during this campaign that I received a lot of questions on the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act and the availability of interpreter services. So, um, and these things are there, but I don't feel that they're um, very well connected to the probate and family court at this time. So. Appreciate your time, uh, Colleen. So good to talk to you and thanks for rushing in to get on here with us at Quincy Access <laughs> Television. Th thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're very welcome. Have a good evening. Well, good another evening. candidate uh, is on his way in. He is a candidate for the Norfolk County Register of Probate. And uh, that is going to be Michael Walsh. She's going to join us in just a moment. Mr. Walsh is a uh, selectman in the town of Westwood. Uh, so uh, it's not his first foray to elective office, uh, but we hope to learn more about his background and his reasoning uh, for running for Register of Probate. As I mentioned, there are, are five candidates seeking uh, that seat that that Patrick McDermott uh, is giving up to run for Norfolk County Sheriff, actually. And we hope to be speaking with Pat uh, later on uh, this evening. But uh, Mr. Walsh, are you, uh, are you with us this evening? His image is on screen, but um, looks like his uh, audio his audio is may not be muted, right. operational. Can't hear him at the moment, unfortunately. Just one of the many challenges <laughs> of remote uh, election coverage in this new uh, virtual world. If you are just joining us, uh, you are watching uh, Quincy Access Television's live primary election nights coverage of uh, the Massachusetts uh, state primary, both live on Quincy Access Television and streaming live on QATV.org, our Facebook and YouTube channels as well. So all firsts for us tonight here, Mark. Yes, yes. And we should mention that uh, the folks behind the scenes that have uh, been uh, helping to get the coverage out, of course, our director, uh, Jonathan Caleri, uh, our engineer, Christopher Potter, and uh, Michael Jarvey, who has, uh, Michael has done a lot of, uh, put a lot of the candidate messages, assembled a lot of those together along with Carol Themen. So we certainly have had a staff to uh, put this together, not a huge staff, uh, but a staff and nonetheless, and um, really a great job done by all. Absolutely. Uh, until we can uh, figure out Mr. Walsh's uh, audio issues, we'll bring in our next guest uh, this evening. It's a, uh, a face and a name that's uh, familiar to a lot of folks here in Quincy and across Norfolk County and across the state as well, and that of uh, Michael Blondie, the former Norfolk County Sheriff, uh, former uh, interim president of Quincy College, and now candidate for a Norfolk County Treasurer. So, uh, Mike, good evening. Hi, Joe. How are you tonight? We're great. Thanks for spending some time with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a... Uh... 
It's a funny time between, you know, the, the polls ending and the, and the counts starting to come in. It's kind of a, a pins and needles time. Absolutely. And uh, lots of changes for you, Mike, over the past uh, few years. Talk a little bit about uh, your, your reasoning for running for treasurer. Yeah, I mean, I know it's going to be a difficult time because of the uh, pandemic and the state level. I've worked with all the stakeholders. I like to think that, you know, with a great staff, we transformed the sheriff's office around reentry, senior and youth programs, uh, a lot of different areas. And the budget of the sheriff's office is the same amount as the budget of the county. So, uh, you know, if I'm lucky enough to win, and Brad really uh, put on a great race, and I like to think I did too. It was a very clean race. It never really got negative. We've all stated our cases, and I'm not sure what the number's going to be, but I, you know, I just want to congratulate Brad and his family uh, for running a great race. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But if I'm lucky enough to win, I'll be able to work with these folks once again because it's going to be very challenging time to bring whatever skills that I have. I know, Michael, one of the things that you would like to bring to the office is education, education for student loans, student debt, financial aid. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think as a parent, and I think most folks out there, uh, especially folks, uh, you know, in a certain kind of income bracket, understand that you can kind of uh, incur a lot of debt. Uh, whether it's uh, credit cards or education in areas and wake up one day and realize that, uh, you know, there might've been some better planning. I think a lot of households go through that, a lot of families. So, you know, I want to bring that experience uh, around those issues in the same way I did with the sheriff's office, bring a lot of awareness and work in the schools uh, and work with uh, the stakeholders and collaborate uh, as I did to make sure that, uh, you know, these young families understand exactly the risk of uh, really financial burdens. And actually starting at the middle school level, Yes, and that's, you know, my camp and my other programs, at-risk programs, the sheriff's office, we're targeting 10 to 14-year-olds because that's an opportunity where they're, you know, gaining more independence and they're giving more freedom by their parents and they start to think, you know, more on their own. So these programs we target, you know, high school, college kids, but also middle schoolers. Mike, can you talk a little bit about the actual role of the Norfolk County Treasurer? What is the job? It's basically, it's, it's the, you know, the most important constituency of the 11,000 active and retired, uh, retirees in making sure your professional is running the, the, the pension fund. And then after that, it's working closely with the different departments and agencies and elected officials to make sure that, uh, you know, you're doing their books and you're working closely with them, predicting and forecasting the budget issues. Also working with Congress uh, on uh, rules and laws and working with the, uh, on the state level. Uh, occasionally you have to change legislation that, increase, that increases the solvency or the stability of the county. And I've worked with all those stakeholders. Talk to, I know you're interested in, obviously, senior programming and uh, fraud protection. Yes. Yeah, and we did that in the sheriff's office. We partnered with the AG, the DA, uh, the federal government, so that the seniors throughout Norfolk County, around uh, some of the programs I have did, like uh, the OK program, the, uh, the uh, triad programs, and, and again, work with closely with all the uh, council and aging, but more particularly with the uh, seniors, so they understand those areas of fraud that are most... Uh, trending at any particular time you know whether it's the grandparent fraud or folks knocking on your door offering to work on your house uh credit card frauds all those frauds it's about awareness and also prosecution working closely with the uh prosecutors on the state and, and local level what was it that uh led you to the decision to, to run uh, i was talking to a lot of the folks uh, who i worked with over the past 20 years and there was this opportunity i, I remember when uh Tim Cahill ran for the first time. I actually was a state legislator and I, and I looked and considered running for it. I always thought it was one of the best jobs in, in county government because uh, it's not overly uh, burdensome with management of people as much as it is about uh, working with uh, a lot of folks around initiatives. And I just, I feel like I've done that and uh, it's gonna, I'm gonna even feel probably more refreshed in doing them revitalized because there's so much you can do uh, that in, in the sheriff's office was a great job was uh, a lot of management. This will be less management and more working and using another uh, skill set. And talk about, if you could, the retirees and something called Teletown Hall events. Yeah, that's what I plan on doing is for the first, again, if I'm fortunate enough to win, to bring uh, uh, those town hall events. Because uh, people are so used to Zoom now and technology and seniors, and we want to increase that you know, and take advantage of some of the changes that have occurred, unfortunately, uh, maybe too fast. And so that folks can sit down uh, through the Tally Town Hall and ask me questions and other folks who work on the uh, county level. And that'll be targeted, you know, primarily for the retirees. Um, how would your experience at, uh, at Quincy College, Mike, uh, translate into the, the treasurer's office? Yeah, I mean, 
Quincy College was a real like a compressed experience for me. Uh, we went in there, the enrollment dropped. Uh, and nobody saw it because the nursing program uh, basically uh, was abolished and lost. And we lost not just that $7 million in the nursing program, but also those other classes that were affected by it. You know, a lot of kids were on the uh, nursing track. So, you know, we were forced to work closely with the mayor, work with the board. Uh, we cut a million dollars without laying anybody off. We cut another million dollars uh, by uh, working with professors and not spending money on adjunct professors. And then we uh, we lobbied the city and received $2.2 .2 million in direct. So uh, I think that experience, it, we had to do it quick. Uh, it stabilized the college and we brought back the nursing program. I learned a lot in a short period of time there. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for joining thank us Mark. this evening. Thank uh, you. Pleasure to have you. Okay, see you guys. Thanks, Mike. Great to see you. Appreciate okay, see you. it. Good much. seeing you. Absolutely. Joining us next is Courtney Madden. She is a candidate for Norfolk County Register of Probate. Courtney, welcome. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Happy primary day. <laughs> That's right. Uh, talk about your reason for running for this office. Sure. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really important position. It touches each and every one of our families and our homes. Um, and so I've been looking for an opportunity where um, my unique set of skills and experiences could offer the most in serving my community. Um, and, and this really aligned with my experience, both in the public sector and the private sector and the legal sector. Um, to have all three of those uh, opportunities kind of come together in, in one uh, position really made this the right place for me to, to launch and to dive in as a first time candidate. I think a lot of folks might not really understand the role of uh, the Norfolk County Register of Probate. As you mentioned, it deals with the families, of course, but there's much more to it than that, isn't there? Yeah. So, I mean, um, the Register of Probate is the keeper of records. So um, if Pat McDermott was on, he would tell you that he holds John Hancock and John Adams wills um, in the in this, at the probate office. Um, but it, he's really expanded the office. And that's what makes it such an attractive position is thinking outside of uh, the clerical and the administrative processes of the Register of Probate and thinking about how do you invest in success for families outside of the courtroom? bringing in public-private partnerships, nonprofits like Dove um, to work with families outside of the courtroom. So not just the hearings, but thinking about those other aspects. And it, I think it's made a, a huge difference. You talked about uh, increasing accessibility and potentially uh, dealing with language gaps. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, right now there is a translator's uh, office through the court system. So no one is necessarily denied uh, assistance when it comes to language, but we do have programs like the Lawyer of the Day program and not necessarily all languages that might be needed are represented in that program. It's volunteer. Um, so it takes some time to develop it. It's actually one of the skill sets that I have is is bringing in fresh and new faces, um, building coalitions, finding the folks that we need to fill those gaps um, is really actually what I do in my day job now. Um, and accessibility means so much more than just language or mobility. It's also how people are presenting themselves at the courthouse. I personally had some experiences in law school where I worked in Northern Israel with minority women. The Israeli legal system is very different in that it um, is not separated from religion. Um, but with that said, people present to the courthouse with different cultural backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, um, and that might preclude them from really being able to reach success, um, either because they're not comfortable asking the questions that they need to ask, um, or we haven't thought about how better to assist them. If you could just uh, talk about uh, the satellite offices, and we're talking about uh, increased uh, technology, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of my big platform pieces was focusing on digital infrastructure. I have built out a digital infrastructure for a national organization. It is a time intensive, labor intensive process, um, reaching out to stakeholders. There's a number of different audiences that we would need to build um, a structure around. It's not just for attorneys or for judges. It's also for the pro se litigant. It's something as simple as knowing what programs are at the courthouse. When I first dove into the race, I couldn't find that. Um, and, and that was very frustrating. The only way to know what resources were available would to actually go to the courthouse or have your attorney tell you. 
But if you weren't being represented by counsel, then you were just kind of lost in this sea. Um, I know a number of my opponents have talked about satellite offices, and I think that's great, but it only makes sense if you have the digital infrastructure. So if you are filing something in a Quincy satellite office or a Franklin satellite office, that it is all coming together into one file for um, a clerk in a court's chamber or something like that. Everything needs to be interconnected. So you can't really have satellite offices. It's like having a DMV with, with offices that don't talk to each other. Well, Colleen, I want to thank you for I'm joining great. us here this evening and uh, quite a different uh, format than uh, most of us are used to operating in, but given the times, uh, that's uh, how we found ourselves. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. Absolutely. And just one quick correction. I'm, I'm Courtney. Courtney, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. My apologies. No problem. Thank you so much, Courtney. Appreciate it. Thank your time. you. Have a good one. Thank you as well. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the entire uh, Quincy estate delegation is running unopposed uh, on the Democratic primary this evening, including second to Norfolk uh, Representative uh, Tacky Chan of Quincy, who is joining us uh, to give a little analysis uh, on this evening's election coverage. So, uh, Tacky, nice to see you uh, again. Thanks for spending some time with us. Hey, Joe. Hi, Tacky. Nice to see you. I see we've uh, put a suit and tie on for this evening. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I got shorts at the bottom, so I'm not getting up. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, as I mentioned, you are uh, unopposed uh, this evening uh, on the Democratic uh, ticket, but I, we'd always appreciate your insight into how you feel this uh, pandemic uh, primary has gone and, and your confidence in, in the mail-in voting system. Very much so. The uh, mail-in ballots uh, was heavily demanded of throughout the uh, month of August. Uh, Secretary Galvin indicates that uh, it's about 800,000 plus people asked for the ballot. Uh, he's projecting very high turnout, largely because of the ballot, because there's no discouraging people from actually voting. The fact that this process is very much like an absentee ballot, where you actually have to apply for a ballot, um, make an effort to get the ballot, and of course sign the ballots in the back back to the, um, the uh, clerk's office and get it in there yourself is an affirmative act. You have to actually put, put the effort in. So unlike some other states that do have automatic ballots, which you just get a ballot in the mail, like just like Utah does that, um, you know, we felt in the legislature that it was important that people, just like going to the polls, you, know, you, you take some responsibility and some affirmative action to get, the, uh, get your own ballot and, and make the effort to put it in. I know, Tacky, if we look at some legislation that uh, you filed, one dealt with um, a relatively new topic. Uh, people are used to drunk driving, but this was actually drug driving. Yeah, some of the uh, issues coming up in the world of legalized marijuana has to deal with uh, how do we actually certify or accurately, how do we know you're actually under the influence of marijuana, I think is the way that we put it. Some people listening will say, oh, you got the glassy eyes, you got the munchies, you're swerving. But unlike a breathalyzer test, there is no way to confirm marijuana in your system. And the other issue with marijuana is that it stays in your body for at least 30 days. So a blood test will be pointless because if you uh, use marijuana 10 days before and you're driving and you took a blood test, it's likely it'll still be in your system. So, you know, I've done legislation to uh, allow the state to utilize a training program that basically goes back to a visual visual and a testing program for cognizant ability as part of a uh, substance abuse pull. So if they believe that you're under the influence of marijuana, they go the police officers will be able to train to use this test um, while you know it's not hundred percent accurate, at least puts a more probability that you are under the influence and then you could write your recitation and take people who could potentially be very dangerous in the road off, off the road as far as safety. Jackie, has there been any indication at all from uh, the House Speaker on when the legislature may actually be back on Beacon Hill? No, we don't have a schedule yet. We uh, are on a subject that's called the chair situation, so to speak. Uh, we are aware that we have several conference committees pending that are, we hope to have reports soon under the rules. You have to have uh, the night before notice, after report is coming by 8 p.m., so it's been a clerk's office by 8 p.m. the day before. So 
keeping session open ensures that we can continue to utilize our existing rules. Obviously, we have the state budget. I heard earlier uh, John Keenan talk about the state budget. Uh, we still don't know what the circumstances are, and uh, we already are on a temporary budget for the next three months. So going uh, through the month of October, we're working on a temporary budget from last year. So we fully expect that some kind of budget debate is going to occur. We're just still working at the details of how we're going to manage that debate. Well, appreciate your time this evening, uh, Tacky, and your insights, uh, and I look forward to our Tacky Talks again uh, in, in the near future. Well, I very much enjoy doing that, uh, and I'll be more casual when we get back to the Tacky Talks. Okay. <laughs> Maybe a haircut by then, too. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, Tacky. And it's black. That's all I got to say. That's right. <laughs> Take care. Take care. We have a candidate uh, about to join us, candidate for Congress in the 8th district, and that would be Dr. Robbie Goldstein. Hello, thanks for joining us. Of course, great to be here tonight. Hi, doctor, nice to see you again. Good to see you again. Sorry I'm not as dressed up as the two of you. I actually just ran in the door from um, being at the last of the precincts that we visited today. Um, We're so hearing I, a lot of that. Yeah. We're <laughs> hearing a lot of that. <laughs> uh, if you could, doctor, Tell us um, why you decided to run for political office. This is your first venture into political office, correct? It is, yes. First time candidate. Um, you know, as you as you said, I'm a doctor. I'm a physician, and largely what I do is primary care. And uh, you know, for the past ten years, I have built a practice at Mass General, and I've spent that time sitting with patients one on one in the exam room. And I hear from them every day the challenges that they're facing. Uh, and I had to make a choice whether I was going to continue to listen to those challenges and know that that I couldn't do anything about that in the exam room or that I was going to throw my hat in the ring and try to change the system. And so 10 months ago, we launched this campaign with the idea to make sure that everyone in every community across the district can live a healthy life. And I know you said... Oh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. I was going to say the uh, the incumbent, Stephen Lynch, has said uh, there's basically not a whole lot of difference between him and and you. How would you respond to that? Well, I respectfully disagree with the congressman. I think that there are many ways in which we differ. Um, and, uh, you know, I have laid out in this campaign all of the votes that he's cast over the past 19 years that I would have voted differently on, starting with the Affordable Care Act, including votes on reproductive rights and immigration policy, uh, votes on the environment, votes on racial justice and police brutality. Uh, I think there are very clear distinctions between the, our two candidacies. And I tried to make this a campaign about the issues to make sure that the voters of the district could really understand those differences. When you mentioned police brutality, obviously the riots that have been happening across the country uh, came to light uh, probably not long after you announced your candidacy. So uh, talk about that and what um, you see happening really across the U.S. Well, I'll, I'll note that I, I launched my campaign in November, long before COVID, long before this um, urgency of the Black Lives Matter movement became present in this country. Uh, but even in November, we were having a conversation about racial justice. And we were talking on the campaign trail every day about how race and structural racism uh, impacts people and their ability to live that healthy life that I talk about, but also their ability to have a job, to go to school, to have a house, all of those important issues. Uh, I see what's happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement with the vigils and rallies, uh, with everything that's happening all across the 8th District and certainly all across the country, um, as our country waking up and realizing that we have a problem with racism in our country. We have a problem with structural and systemic racism. And for us to deal with that, we have to do some really, really hard work. And it's going to be hard, uh, but it's necessary work to do. That includes thinking about our laws and how they affect policing in this country. It includes the entire criminal legal system, um, how people move through that system, but it also includes the racism that exists in education policy, and housing policy, and certainly in healthcare. Speaking of, how has this pandemic kind of pulled back the cover on uh, disparities in healthcare? Well, you know, the disparities that we see in COVID-19, and we're seeing them day after day, week after week, and the numbers that are coming out from Massachusetts and from across the country, um, those disparities existed long before COVID. 
But now we have put a spotlight on those disparities. Um, you know, I, I mentioned I'm a primary care physician. Most of the patients I take care of are folks living with HIV or at risk for HIV. Uh, and we know that that is a virus that disproportionately impacts black and brown communities in this country. Uh, so I've, I've been seeing this, I've been living in this space, these disparities. Uh, what I'm hopeful for is that we as a nation have now recognized the disparities and we can put in systems that will allow us to actually address this racism, address those disparities. Right? We have to collect the right data. We've got to make sure that we're making the right interventions in the right populations. We have to make sure that we're actually thinking about race in our policy and not just blindly putting policies out. Um, and COVID, I think, has given us that opportunity to do that. It was work that we've had to do, do for a very, very long time. And lastly, doctor, you had um, established a transgender health program at uh, Mass General. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, that's the work of the past five years of my time in the hospital. Um, you know, I, I built a program along with so many colleagues and community organizations and people within the transgender community, uh, a program that changed the structure of Mass General Hospital, for sure, it changed the structure of the broader healthcare system. Um, it's changed our ability to deliver care all across New England to a very vulnerable population. Those are the patients that I'm talking about when I say that I'm, I'm having conversations about challenges that people are facing every day. Um, it's specifically those that are marginalized and vulnerable and left out of our system. Well, doctor, thank you very much for joining us here this evening. Thank well, you for having well. me on. I'm sure we have a long night ahead of us on the campaign side. You probably have a long night as well. Yes, indeed. I appreciate your time. Thank you also for participating in the, in the five minute piece uh, that we uh, put together here at QE TV. That was a great help. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much. Take care. Michael Walsh. Uh, yes, we have Michael Walsh back with us, uh, candidates for register of our probate and also a uh, selectman in the town of Westwood. So Mr. Walsh, welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Great to have you finally. Yes, well, I was, you know, I logged on early. I didn't have my time, I think, scheduled till 835. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, tell me if you could, uh, why you chose this office, the Register of Probate, uh, to run for? So I have been involved in the family court, but pretty much all courts across Massachusetts. And so when I looked at the race of candidates who are in the race, no one is um, has both an elected office and uh, a trial attorney. I really believe, honestly, that this should be a trial attorney. That, and I think the legislature has learned from some of the other courts, not Norfolk, of course, uh, while Mr. McDermott's there. But if you check Suffolk, Middlesex, people who are not attorneys got in and had uh, made it a devastating mistake. In fact, uh, Suffolk actually removed their clerk for a while. Um, and so, you know, it's important. It's, it's a very important office. And I don't, just because no one knows what it does is because of the name. If you tell people it's the family court, then they all have an idea of exactly what it is. So um, in the beginning, that's exactly why I got in, looking at who was in the race and, uh, you know, the three candidates from Quincy, I said, uh, this is an important job. Someone needs to get in who knows about the court system. And that's exactly why I got in. Do you think, uh, Mr. Walsh, that it's so important that it maybe should be appointed rather than elected? Well, um, I suppose that would depend. I mean, you know, the election is for a six year term and appointment would be almost lifetime. So I don't know that it would be to that level. I mean, I think. Uh, that needs to be changed. Sometimes people get put in and it's only unless something really erupts that they get removed when they're appointed. At least with the election cycle, you get a chance to get people in and out based on their performance. I think, um, you know, if you get it, obviously six years is a long term. It, you know, there's no mulligan in two years like you have for state rep or for state senate. Uh, this is a long term position and it's really important to get someone in there who, you know, knows people, can work with staff, understands budgets. Um, you know, I was on earlier listening to um, Miss Madden, and I can tell you that, you know, it's important to know the budgets. And you, you can think that uh, budgets, uh, you know, you have to come up with them. You have to sit down with the judges, trial court, and come up with the budgets along with the other 14 counties. So it, it's going to be negotiation. You know, we all have great ideas what to do, but if there's no money there and you can't get it through the legislature or through the trial court, those ideas are just going to sit on the table until the money's available. Mr. Walsh, if we could talk about uh, technology and uh, you are a proponent of e-filing. Correct. So I, I'll, I would say that because, you know, um, for example, workers' comp, Social Security, federal court cases, 
I could file all of my documents without a, ever visiting a courthouse. They come up with a Q-Reader code, and that code automatically gets, can get faxed in, can get scanned in, and automatically goes to the file. If you just think about how important that could be, anyone can do it. I mean, if you had a document that you had to get to court and you have the e-file sheet, you could just go to Staples, scan it in, and you know, email it in, and the fax machine will put it right into the file. That's the technology that's available. It hasn't been available at this courthouse yet, but it is out there. You know, uh, the Department of Industrial Accidents, where a lot of people you know, who get injured obviously go to, they have an e-filing system where the same thing happens. And you don't have to be there. You don't have to be at the courthouse. And I think especially with COVID, that's going to become important to keep people out of the courthouse. Right now, the probate court, as of um, yesterday, it's great. The court is open, but they can't have more than five members of the public in there right now because of the numbers. So it's important to try to figure this, these things go out, uh, think, yeah, figure them out going forward. And uh, I'll be honest with you, the legal system is way behind the business world, um, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, I actually am supposed to run a meeting tomorrow morning with 65 people on you know, a networking group, just like we're doing here. And uh, we're able to pull off everything from, you know, breakout rooms, et cetera. The legal system never heard of this until uh, COVID kicked in. So uh, we just need to make more partnerships with the, the, the world out there, the business world, and figure out how to get it done and bring it into the court system. As registered probate, as you mentioned, you're dealing with uh, some pretty intense um, family issues and major landmarks in people's lives, um, divorces, deaths. Um, there's uh, domestic abuse issues, adoption issues. How will your experience um, as a selectman help you in that role? So, obviously, I mean, I, the, the number one thing about the probate court is helping people to understand, what, first of all, what they're up against. But the number one thing as a lawyer is to bring down their stress level. And you bring down the stress level by having them prepared, giving them the information they need, explaining, you know, little nuances of a judge. Those are important things that um, the people need to understand. And, I, you know, one thing that I talked about during this campaign is educating the public. Some people are, you know, can read instructions, right? But if, if we could all read instructions, there wouldn't be little diagrams that go with them. And so if you just think about that for a second, there are people who are visual learners, and right now, the court system does not provide any visual learning for those type of people you know, who, who do that. And a classic example for me is my son has dyslexia. And uh, you know, he can watch a movie and recite it back to you. But could he read the book? It's going to take him twice as long as someone else. So understanding the things that you go through in life and how everybody's a little bit different, it's about making this court system uh, more user-friendly, especially for members of the public. The bar will tell you, and as a member of the bar, the Norfolk County Bar, they're not afraid to tell you what they think you need to fix. But the public is not so keen on that and don't, doesn't really know what they don't know. And so I think it's really about making it accessible to everybody by making it easier and reducing the stress level. You know, I said from day one, the number one frustration for me in this court system and every court system is voicemail, right? You don't know who you need to talk to, so how can you ask the right questions? The last thing that I said, um, you know, is that when I become registered or probate, if I'm lucky enough, we're going to get rid of the phone system. At least someone's going to answer the phone from the front desk and say, you know, thank you for calling the Norfolk Probate Court. How can we help you? And then you someone at the desk listens to the complaint and says, you know what? I know the exact person you need to talk to. That is so-and-so, their extension so-and-so, and let me connect you. Now, I'm not sure on that end, what, on the other end, whether or not that person will still have voicemail. But now you have a name, an extension of the person that you know need to talk to. That is probably, never mind being a lawyer, as a member of the public, those are the things that really would make a difference and bring, start to bring down the stress level right from the beginning. And that's, you know, because the only thing that good happens in this court is adoption. I want to thank you for joining us this evening and uh, certainly taking part in the uh, candidates' messages as well at uh, QATV. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. It's always my pleasure to get an opportunity to speak. You know, lawyers don't have any trouble uh, filling time. So <laughs> thank you, guys. Listen, have a great night. It's uh, It's been a great race. Uh, now it's just wait and see the results. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time, Mr. Walsh. Right. Take care. Here. Speaking of uh, results, uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier here at Quincy Access Television, we won't be able to bring you numbers um, this evening. Um, due to the uh, logistics of the, of the pandemic, because the numbers uh, at the precincts here in Quincy are not the final numbers. Uh, there's actually a central tabulation going on at City Hall of all the mail-in 
ballots. And as we heard uh, the city clerk say, there were over 10,000 of those. Uh, so those will be added in to the actual in-person votes uh, that happens today, along with the early voting and also the absentee balloting. And then the provisional ballots were overseas. Uh, so it might be uh, tomorrow morning, actually, uh, before final numbers, uh, even unofficial ones, are actually available. So we should uh, certainly encourage folks to tune in to AM Quincy tomorrow, and uh, potentially you may have some numbers, correct, Joe? We will do our very best, absolutely. I know that uh, they'll be up late at the city clerk's office uh, counting uh, this evening uh, for sure. Uh, so if we do have them, we'll certainly bring them bring them to you. Of course, they'll just be Quincy numbers. So even the county races so will not be definitive until those are, are completely uh, tabulated as well. And it may be the similar situation uh, for the general election on November 3rd, where the turnout will n undoubtedly be much higher uh, than it is uh, this evening. And we should mention that uh, obviously I had addressed the candidates' messages that uh, candidates took part in. That was one offering of Quincy Access Television. But you on AM Quincy have had quite a few of the candidates in, sometimes multiple times. Yes, uh, Dr. Goldstein was uh, with us a couple of times. Uh, Kevin O'Connor, a Republican uh, candidate for U.S. Senate, uh, joined us um, as well, uh, along with uh, some of the county candidates, too. So we were able to, uh, to chat with them and get information out. Again, all virtually, all remotely, uh, nobody uh, in the studio. So this is all uh, really historic um, this year in 2020 in many different ways, uh, of course, nationally and right here at Quincy Access Television and uh, the way we're bringing you coverage um, and also uh, the way that we're gathering information. It, it's, all, uh, it's all brand new. Well, uh, currently joining us is the uh, current Norfolk County Sheriff, Jerry McDermott. Uh, Jerry, welcome. Well, his image is with us. His audio might not be. Another uh, another issue, <laughs> trying to do a re remote broadcasting live. <laughs> but uh, we, hopefully we can uh, resolve that quickly. Uh, Mr. McDermott, are you, are you with us now? The picture well, looks fantastic. We just <laughs> made the audio. <laughs> Goes to show... Uh, you can look great, but if you if you can't hear them, then it's it's not going to work. Unfortunately, uh, we're still waiting for Mr. McDermott to connect uh, to our feed here at Quincy Access Television, and uh, maybe we've got him now. Mr. McDermott, I do hear him typing away. So let's see if he can. Mr. McDermott, can you hear us? Telling us he's having audio issues. So yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll see if we can correct those. Uh, in the meantime, we'll remind you we're providing live election coverage here at Quincy Access Television, both uh, on air and online on our website, and our Facebook and YouTube channels. Well, that is another first for us um, as well. It is, and uh, you know, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't come without uh, glitches like this one, but. Uh, I know we can get past it. I'm sure we will have Jerry here. He just uh, actually recently texted about potentially phoning in. So we may have him on a phone line. We, we can hear we can hear back background noise, but we just can't uh, hear him, un, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we should let folks know, too, that Mark, you and I are uh, in our homes um, this evening, as we have been really since well, the middle of March, uh, for the most part. So, uh, broadcasting this evening. Well, we should mention that, uh, yes, and, and through our executive director, Jonathan. Hello. Jerry. Oh, here is Jerry. We'll get back to that. Now we'll talk to Jerry. Uh, Jerry, welcome. His lips are moving, but we can't hear him speaking. <laughs> we, we had Jerry for a second. Your, uh, your audio is muted, Mr. McDermott, if there's a way for you to... Uh, unmute that so we can Let's hear. see. Unmute my audio with Alt plus A. You're good. We can hear you. Um, we can hear you. Sounds like you've got multiple devices going. Yeah, that's not going to do it. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like he can hear us. 
which is too bad. But uh, he is, uh, of course, the um, sitting. How's that? Chair. Yes. Can you hear me now? Hear we can. Can you hear us? Unfortunately. But uh, Mr. McDermott was uh, appointed by the governor to fill the uh, term that was uh, left vacant when Mike Lotti uh, departed to become the interim Quincy College president. Uh, so. Uh, oh, yeah, we, we can hear you okay. Um, okay. Let's see. So trying to solve those uh, technical issues, unfortunately. There are actually uh, three candidates for uh, Norfolk County Sheriff on the Democratic primary, and uh, that would be James Coughlin, Pat McDermott, and former Quincy Mayor William Phelan. And uh, we hope to hear from them uh, later on uh, this evening uh, as well. And then to there? with uh, Mr. McDermott as best we can. And we were mentioning how our executive director, Jonathan Caleri, really didn't miss a beat uh, from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Programming was um, continuing. Again, you had mentioned we have been doing a lot of programming remotely. You from your house, mine from mine, uh, of my programming from mine. And it has gotten onto the air and onto our website, which is brand new, we should mention as well. Uh, so we really have taken pains, I guess, to get the information out there. And of course, that's why we exist. Yeah, we've uh, had a, a whole crew behind us to help us uh, with that, um, producing these programs virtually and getting them up on our channels in, uh, in very quick time to keep the programming current and relevant and really up to date, even despite the fact that uh, we're still not open um, to the public due to safety concerns. However, um, we're still here and uh, we're still keeping on top of what's going on um, in the city for folks, and we do appreciate their support um, as well. We should mention that all 30 precincts in a normal election night coverage, all 30 precincts are covered by our members and volunteers. So if you look at events that Quincy Access Television does over the course of a year, election coverage is extremely big. There's a lot of folks involved. There's no question it couldn't happen uh, without them, really. Um, and, and tonight is an obvious example because without them, we were unable to bring you um, the numbers, and we're able to uh, to bring you this coverage instead. We do appreciate all the candidates who agreed to participate um, in this evening's coverage because it wouldn't happen without without them as well. And Joe, just as as we talk through election night coverage here, uh, and again the impressive lineup that you had as guests on AM Quincy. That um, uh, certainly people. It sounded like people sweet. wanted to be involved in politics and they felt it important to jump into the race very much so um there was no hesitation on the part of, of candidates to participate um it's amazing how folks quickly you know pivoted when the pandemic hit to this uh, virtual world in order to keep communication open and, and keep getting their message out and we were ha happy to, to be a part of that um, really to be able to provide that conduit uh, to the community, what I feel was um, really a critical role and, 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 and something that they might not have had the opportunity to do without public access uh, television. And I'm down here in Plymouth, and I know a lot of uh, meetings have been taking place remotely. Uh, there have been selectmen meetings. Uh, I know, obviously, uh, the Quincy City Council hasn't met during the summer, but um, their last meeting and quite a few meetings before were done via Zoom. Uh, they are scheduled to meet in September, the month that we're in now. Uh, I assume we're starting, we're continuing with the Zoom sessions. As far as I know, I have not heard yet from Council President Liang about that. Um, but as far as I know, that will be at least how they will start the new session. Uh, also new for us here at QA TV, we're covering school committee meetings. Um, as well, and now um, zoning board meetings um, as well. So in some ways, uh, the pandemic has allowed us to do new things uh, that we might not have done otherwise. So there is, uh, you know, opportunities uh, in this in this crisis as well that, that we're taking advantage of. Well, I think access centers in general have uh, what I've seen. And again, living in Plymouth, I, I do get that Plymouth perspective. Uh, they really have 
stepped up to the plate and uh, provided uh, coverage for folks in this pandemic that um, really without it, people would not be able to see. No question, yeah. And uh, I would encourage folks too to participate in the Quincy Cultural Memories uh, Project. And I'm thinking uh, as I'm speaking about this that we should add our coverage tonight to, to that project because it really is documenting uh, life experiences of people in Quincy during the pandemic through photographs, through videos, artwork, um, essays, poems, songs, um, whatever uh, you experience during your everyday life uh, in this pandemic in Quincy is acceptable in this project. It's simply quincyculturalmemory.com. It's a cooperative partnership between us here at QATV, the city, the Thomas Crane Public Library, and Quincy 400, all uh, getting together to uh, really document this historic uh, event for the future. And we still, unfortunately, don't have uh, Jerry McDermott. I know we're still working through technical issues. Uh, potentially, we could get him on a phone line. I think he was looking to, to go that route. Um, we hope to. We haven't given up. We're, we're still trying. This is uh, the first issue that's cropped up uh, this evening. So not bad for our, for our first go at this. Um, and it uh, looks like we'll be doing the same thing for the November election. Mark, I know you had a chance to speak with uh, the city clerk, Nicole Crispo, um, about uh, November and uh, about some key dates that'll be happening leading up to that uh, election. Uh, mostly more early voting, is that right, um, than we had for the primary? That's correct. And I don't have those dates uh, available, but she did mention uh, that uh, quincyma.gov Go there and go to the election page and there will be a list of dates. So certainly uh, one can access all those dates from there. We should also mention that the interview that I did with Nicole earlier today will be at the end of this uh, program. So folks will be able to get at least some of the dates uh, from her when she speaks, but even she references the website. So uh, folks, once again, quincyma.gov. Folks can certainly access that. Yes, and it's already posted on our website as well at qatv.org, so folks can uh, can watch it there as well. I believe we have uh, finally straightened out all the wires and plugged in all the tubes and <laughs> are connecting with uh, Norfolk County Sheriff uh, Jerry McDermott. Mr. McDermott, uh, good evening. Hey, good evening. Can you guys hear me all right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can hear you, and we can see you. We've got both audio and visual, so nice to see you. Terrific. All right. At least we've got, at least now we've got the, uh, the audio and the video. So, so good evening to you guys. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard any results yet. Unfortunately, we have not. We're unable uh, to, to gather the numbers this evening just because of the, the widespread uh, vastness of the, of the county. Um, but curious, uh, <laughs> does, does the technical issues we have <laughs> indicate a, a, a bigger uh, problem with, at the county level that needs uh, technology upgrades? No, no. This is actually at my campaign headquarters, and uh, uh, the speakers, for some reason, aren't working on the, on the uh, desktop. So I'm relegated to the uh, smartphone. And uh, without my two teenage daughters nearby, you can imagine my stress level trying to make sure that I could join you this evening. Usually well, I just hand the devices to my kids and they straighten everything out for me. I do the same thing. I have a 17 year old, so I, I know exactly all about that. He's my, uh, he's my technical wizard. And he looks at me as if to say, why don't you know this? I think it's the age. Yeah, uh, it sure is. Mr. McDermott, uh, talk about, yep. uh, I know you've been sheriff for a little while. Talk about some of the successes and why you would like to continue. Sure. So um, right when I got appointed by Governor Charlie Baker back in uh, 2018, December 2018, uh, one thing that struck me right away was that most of the county sheriffs had uh, their female offenders sent to uh, that was uh, MCI uh, Framingham. And so I immediately said, we're not going to have that happen. We're going to make sure that uh, our female offenders are brought to uh, the county level and afforded the same opportunity at rehabilitation and all the robust programming so that we could fix the whole person. And uh, I thought it wasn't equitable treatment the way that women were treated. Um, so I, I straightened that out right away. Uh, right now, I, I'm glad to say that female offenders 
are um, brought over to the uh, Suffolk County uh, South Bay facility. And eventually we're going to retrofit the um, facility over here in, in uh, Dedham and make sure that the uh, women are uh, in what I like to call it more of a dormitory setting. Um, so that's going to, let me see if I shut this one down. I might be able to see you guys better. Let's see how that works. Um, is this any better? That's fine. Mark. Just don't, don't lose us. No. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is yeah, fine you got for me. us. Okay, great. So um, I'm not quite sure what's happening here with this. I'm going to try to see if I can get you like this. Um, all right. How are we doing now? We're doing have good. I still got you, Mark? Still have us. Okay, fantastic. And we still so, have um, you. Yeah, the big, issue, the big issue for me was the equitable treatment of our, of our women and their programming. And then also, um, one of the biggest issues is the opioid crisis. And the governor and I really had a long talk about what we could do to uh, lower recidivism. The only way we're going to make our community safer and lower recidivism is by uh, tackling the mental health issues. Uh, so I launched the first of its kind task force on juvenile mental health and substance abuse. Because if we can get to our kids early and not have a stigma around mental health, and we can get them the services that they need and, and they can work with counselors. Um, that's so important. And we don't want to wait till kids are in high school and they're now self-medicating. So, uh, you know, keeping the county safe is my top priority, running a safe and secure house of correction. But there's so much more to being a sheriff than just ha having people in your care and custody and having them do their time. It's about good programming, equaling good corrections and really being a forward thinking sheriff. So I want to continue that work. It's called uh, the Corrections Institute. So a big part of your role, I'm sure, is uh, preventing repeat offenders. How, uh, how would you accomplish that? So um, we do call it House of Correction for a reason, because we want people to leave us better off than when they first came into our care and custody. And in order to do that, you really have to get at the person to find out what's happened in their past, have them talk with our behavioral health specialists, see what illicit drugs they were using out in the street, um, get them into a, a, what I call a, a very forward-thinking program called the Medication Assisted Treatment, or MAT, M-A-T, and really have medical team work with mental health uh, in, in all kinds of counseling and programming so that you can find out what happened in that person's childhood, what happened to them throughout their uh, adolescence, and what led them to a life of crime that landed them in jail. If we can fix that, if we can fix that whole person, we're not just repairing one broken person. We're fixing a family that was experiencing dysfunction because the whole family suffers. You strengthen that family, you make that community safer. Uh, and so in order to do that, you, you, it takes everything. And it, it also takes Reverend clergy. I've got imams, rabbis, uh, Protestant clergy, Roman Catholic. Um, you know, Norfolk County, most of our inmates are Roman Catholic. Majority of our inmates are white. Uh, and I can tell you 75% of the people in our care and custody are people that have a dual diagnosis of mental illness and substance abuse. Talk about, I know that, uh, I believe it was a new program, uh, a new initiative, and that was uh, the garden. There was a garden planted uh, at the facility, correct? That's correct. That's correct. So, uh, you know, I looked around and we, we had a lot of space uh, at the perimeter of the jail and over by our pre-release center, which is called the Dedham Alternative Center, um, I saw that we had kind of a older, dilapidated greenhouse, not a lot going on there. And I, I would see that, you know, other than um, some classroom time, uh, inmates had some time on their hands. I mean, they could go shoot baskets, play basketball, but um, I really wanted to see if we couldn't teach them a marketable skill and teach them about uh, sustainability with organic um, gardening. So they loved it. Um, everything from building the flower beds, um, the vegetable beds, uh, right up until, uh, sorry about all the text messages coming in, and then uh, right up until planting, uh, fertilizing, and growing uh, peppers and tomatoes and cucumbers, um, basil and oregano. They they are so uh, so thrilled to learn this skill, and it's something that they can take with them because most of the people in our care custody are moms and dads. So if you can teach them the skill, it's going to help out their families. They're going to eat healthier. Uh, but also it's something that they can take with them, uh, teach their own kids. But it's a marketable skill. So, um, you know, we're looking at every facet of, of how we can train people to be employable, uh, to be more self-sufficient when they leave us. Uh, we even, even have certificates uh, with veterinary services, uh, with carpet cleaning, 
you name it, uh, painting, landscaping. We get these folks out uh, working in the community uh, so that they do have a good skill set when they leave us. And my hope, Mark, going forward is to work with the building trades unions and really start an apprenticeship type of program so that um, you could imagine retired union workers, bricklayers, plumbers um, coming up and uh, teaching their skills to our inmates so that, again, when they leave us, they're more self-sufficient and they're not going back to the old lifestyle they led. Appreciate your time. I'm glad we were able to uh, resolve the technical difficulties. It's a, a testament to your persistence, Mr. McDermott. So uh, thanks again. Well, hey, listen, well, you know, we, we might have to add some programming up at the jail on, uh, on uh, uh, technical issues 101 so that I can have some training. My kids could teach us, teach us that class. But listen, you guys have a great night. I would like to say one thing. You know, I know I had three competitors uh, tonight, uh, Jim Coughlin, uh, Bill Fallon, and uh, Pat McDermott, all good people from good families. And I just want to wish them the very best. And uh, a, a big thank you to their supporters because campaigns are tough. It's a lot of work. And um, oftentimes the people that are out there dropping literature door to door or holding signs are forgotten. So even though those folks are out um, working for three other candidates, I'd like to say thank you for all their efforts. Thank you. Thank you to say. And uh, speaking of, uh, we have one of those three candidates with us right now, the current register of uh, probate candidate for Norfolk County Sheriff, uh, Pat McDermott of Quincy. Uh, Pat, nice to see you. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, th thank you, Mark, and, and to Joe and to Jerry, you know, and, uh, for, for, uh, for, everybody, for the comments tonight. Um, it's always good to have QA TV in the house. Uh, we've got three television sets going tonight. And uh, it's not the same as we're used to having, but uh, it's still a robust night. We have uh, we have some family and friends over. We all have we're all tuned into QA TV to, to check out uh, at least the comments from the elected officials. We're getting some raw data in, and hopefully we'll have at least some preliminary results within the next hour or so to to at least kind of shape up where the race is going this uh, this fall. Well, I know uh, you have always found Quincy Access Television on election night, so we certainly wanted to continue the tradition yeah normally i'm this is the first time i've actually been on the ballot like i've been on the i was on recently on the ballot in march for the presidential election as the democratic state committee man for the norfolk and plymouth senate district but you know i know that that's not highly covered at all but i haven't been personally on the ballot for 18 years since 2002 so normally i'm on as a commentator on some of the victory campaigns for the democratic party that i've orchestrated over the years with my good friend Alicia Gardner, and you know we've had some fun over the years putting those together. And QA TV has always been a great mouthpiece for us to a sounding board for us to get the message out post, you know whether it's post primary or even on November, you know to, to let the message go forth. So it's always been great. So Pat, why sheriff? Hey, you know I've had a blessed 18 years running uh, and serving at the people in Norfolk County as the Register of Probate. Six years prior to that, as the City Councilor from Ward Three in Quincy, um, you know you run you, you run its course. And uh, a couple of years ago, as, as my wife and I started talking about looking in the future and whether or not I would seek a fourth term, uh, we started talking differently. That that maybe you know after three terms, just like I did on the City Council in Quincy, moving away on my own merit, saying you know I've done all of the things that I wanted to do uh, in terms of technology and innovation, access to justice programs, uh, it was time to get a new set of eyes in there. And, and at the same time, ironically, you know, Mike Bellotti and I, who have been friends for many, many years, I was his aide up the state house. Um, I always jokingly said, Mike, if you ever taken a look at something else, if you wouldn't mind giving me a heads up, I wouldn't mind taking a look at the sheriff's race as the next challenge that I have in public life. And two years ago, Mike and I sat down when he was, uh, being considered for the president of Quincy College, and um, and I started making my phone calls and started asking uh, some some real uh, uh, telling questions to to folks that work at the jail, people that participate in programs, former inmates, um, as to what they their vision of the sheriff's office ought to be. And the more and more I had those discussions, the more and more I felt as though this was a calling and a passion that I wanted to pursue, and we did so, and it was great. And this has so far been one of the most exhilarating campaigns I've ever been on. And Pat, how would you address or newly address, I suppose, the addiction crisis? So yeah, this is, and, and I, I, I'm really kind of angry about the fact that, you know, we've, we've been under this horrific crisis of COVID-19. Um, and then in conjunction with the, with the 
the real issue with, with the, the systemic racism issue and then the issue with the, 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 the tragic uh, murder of, of George Floyd. So we've been under this real tense relationship now. Um, but, but unfortunately to me, the opioid addiction problem, A, has not gone away, but it's been overshadowed by these other things. And that's the problem with the media. Sometimes we often, you know, we wait for the next best story to come by and we leave that last story out. There are people dying from opioid addiction and alcohol addiction every day in Norfolk County. And so the bottom line at the end of the day, we need to refocus and repurpose ourselves. From the jail's perspective, the vast majority of the inmates that are, that are in, the, in the Norfolk County Correctional Facility have some kind of substance abuse issue or mental health issues. So those issues aren't going away and we need to make sure we focus on those. And as the next sheriff, it is my, my absolute focus on my recidivism plan to keep people from rotating in and out of the out of the criminal justice system, that we focus on those unique issues that affect people, why they're coming into jail in the first place. Alcohol, drug addiction, uh, economic insecurity, food insecurity, uh, job skills. Uh, we're, we're dropping the ball on these things, and it's been going on for the last couple of years at the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office. We need to take back the reins and elect a leader to that job that will make sure that we have a robust an expansive role of public safety for the people in Norfolk County. Pat, really appreciate uh, your time tonight and your support at QATV over the years. And hopefully next time it'll be in person. Have a, have a great evening. I look forward to it. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Joining us next is Stephen Lynch. He is Congressman Stephen Lynch. He's up for re-election in the 8th Congressional District. Mr. Lynch, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Mark. Hello, Joe. Good to see you again. Nice to see you again. My pleasure. So one of the things uh, you had said um, that uh, why you want to maintain the office is to take away the crazy time and turbulence in Congress that we currently see, correct? Well, that, that's for me to control that would be a little bit of an overstatement, I think, under the circumstances. What I did say was that uh, I, I think what the country needs is a steady hand. What the district needs is a steady hand, right? So we need to try to, you know, stabilize our situation. We need to get out of this pandemic. Uh, we need to have a, uh, a sense in, in Quincy and in the 8th Congressional District where there's some semblance of normalcy, where people can go to school and go to work and, and, and get back to that, that situation. So. Uh, I've been working hard at that uh, to the point where, you know, where we did not have enough, uh, you know, protective equipment, getting, working with Gillette Company, getting masks, face masks, uh, working with the local hospitals in the, in the, in the district and uh, health centers, uh, working closely with, uh, with Manit Community Health Center in Quincy and, uh, you know, Cynthia Sierra and her team, making sure they have the, the testing kits and the the masks and and face shields to do their job so keeping people safe but also you know working with the cares act uh under the cares act we were able to provide millions of dollars uh in support uh for again for ppe but also uh you know 260 billion dollars for uh for support for unemployment benefits and uh stimulus payments uh even but people in the gig economy who didn't contribute to the unemployment uh, system, they were able to get relief. So, uh, you know, we did a lot. We, we have more to do, but, you know, I, I think we're working in that direction, working in that direction, trying to stabilize the situation for people so that, uh, again, we can get back to some sense of normalcy where people can go to work and, and uh, you know, send their kids to school and feel safe in doing that where teachers can actually go and do their jobs and feel safe doing that. Uh, stabilization, that's what I meant. Your challenger has kind of uh, painted a picture of himself as uh, more progressive, Your, yourself as more conservative. He's taken you to task uh, on a vote against the Affordable Care Act. So yeah. how, how would you respond to that? Well, it's a little bit ridiculous, right? Because my opponent is trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Right. He's trying to go to Medicare for all, which would end all private health insurance. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is a system where 
uh, it tried to create some competition to lower prices, but it did not do that because it had an antitrust exemption in there for the insurance companies. Uh, it didn't have a public option. We've been able to put back uh, some things that uh, that caused the Affordable Care Act to raise prices on on, on health insurance. We we have. Uh, removed the tax on union health care benefits, which was very important. Those people, you know, like my mom and dad and like myself, stood out on picket lines to get higher health care uh, coverage for union members. And the Affordable Care Act, in, in one of its odd uh, provisions, punished the people who stood on a picket line and got good health benefits. So it had a tax on what it called Cadillac, uh, Cadillac plans. Uh, I think the better way to do it is to fix the Affordable Care Act. Take the things out of it that are causing prices to go high, which is one of the things is the antitrust exemption that we gave to insurance companies that works to push up prices. Uh, the other is to get a public option. So I'm sponsoring a bill right now to, to put a public option in the Affordable Care Act so that states can get into the game in terms of providing a, a low-cost, competitive no frills healthcare plan that people can afford. It's interesting because there are 30, 330 million people in the country. And in the current enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act, only 10 million people signed up. 10 million people out of 330 million people in the country. So clearly people are voting with their feet. It's too expensive. If you look at the plans, it's too expensive. So we got to lower the price. We can Look, the Affordable Care Act is fixable. It's fixable. That's not what my opponent wants to do. He wants to get rid of it and go with a so-called Medicare for all plan. So while he criticizes me for voting against the original version, he's voting to get rid of it entirely. And I, th I think it's fixable. And I, I think we could, we could do a good job if we just take those three elements, the antitrust exemption, get rid of that, force insurance companies to compete, have a public option that would be low cost and, and reasonable. The state, if it offers it, doesn't have to get a profit on that health care plan. They, they just need to break, break even. And then, of course, we got rid of the tax on union health care benefits, which I think was a great idea. As a former you know, union president and someone who helped run our uh, insurance plan and, and, it, and helped with the administration of that, you know, I, I think it's a much better and much fairer result for people, for working people. I know you worked, uh, Congressman, on the opioid addiction issue, uh, still obviously an issue. Uh, yeah. What would you do going forward? Well, uh, I actually founded one of the first uh, adolescent residential facilities for kids that are struggling with opioid, either uh, either OxyContin or, or, in many cases, heroin. They, you know, they start with the prescription drugs and then they end up with with heroin. So. Uh, right now, I, so I founded the Cushing House for Boys originally, 22 beds, and now uh, we've got the Cushing House for Girls, which is a residential facility, also uh, affiliated with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the Quincy program, uh, CQ, which is uh, Cushing Quincy. So they've got, a, they've got a version of that in Quincy as well that's operated very, very well. Uh, John McGann is the CEO of that program. So uh, you know, I think education is very, very important. I think uh, we, we've, we've actually been able to require some of these uh, pharmaceutical companies to change the formulary and, and the way they make those uh, pharmaceuticals to make them less abusable. So they used to have a, a system where you could actually crush it up and snort it. Uh, now we've made them go to like a gel system. There also are some some other uh, injectable uh, 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 medications that, that can be used that are, are much less prone to abuse. So there are a lot of things we can do there. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, prosecuting some of these companies that we're, we're bringing in, uh, you know, and, and uh, administering drugs just through pill mills. Uh, I, I am a co-sponsor and a, a co-chairman of the... Uh, the uh, pharmacy, uh, uh, pharmacy, pharmacy abuse task force uh, with Hal Rogers from Kentucky. Uh, they've got pill mills down, down south that uh, really exacerbate the problem for them. 
Uh, I'm also working with the DEA on trying to block fentanyl. A lot of it's coming from Southeast Asia and China. So we're working with them on trying to block that uh, from coming through the mails. And we've had some success, but obviously there's more work to be done. Congressman, we could go on, but unfortunately we don't have the time this evening, but I want to thank right. you. And the polls are closed, so I'm not sure what, you know, and the numbers look good. The numbers look good, so I'm very happy for that. Um, yeah, so people have made their decision already. Uh, the polls are closed. Uh, I want to thank the people from Quincy. We had a great, great response in Quincy and a great result. Uh, we got many of our numbers back, so a, a very healthy win in Quincy. I am so thankful uh, to the people of Quincy for their trust in me. And uh, I promise that uh, going back to Washington, I'll, I'll bring back a little bit of Quincy to Washington, D.C. in the United States Congress every single day. Thank you for your trust in me, and I'm, I'm very grateful for your, your support. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Just joining us here at Quincy Access Television, you're watching our live for primary night election coverage here at QA TV and streaming live on QATV.org and on Facebook and YouTube um, as well. I'm unable right. to bring you numbers um, this evening, but we are able to bring you many uh, of the candidates that were on the ballot today huh? and uh, one that will be familiar to many people in Quincy and across Massachusetts for that matter would be uh, Joe Shea, former Quincy city clerk, now Norfolk County commissioner and a candidate uh, for re-election to that post. Joe, how are you? I'm great, Joe. How are you? We're well. It's, uh, are you watching Mark? Is, is here as well. How's Mark? Yeah. Doing? Good. How are you, Joe? Good to see you. Great. I'm, I'm, having a, I'm having a great day, as you can imagine. And it is a beautiful day. But uh, it's a big county, and uh, I, I spent a lot of time the last few months working hard. But we're very happy with the results. We've gotten most of Quincy in. We've got the town of Holbrook in. We've got the town of Avon in. And, and it's very very positive for me and i'm i'm i'm, I'm excited and i'm excited to be uh i believe on the ballot for november and uh you know these are troubled times but we're gonna we're gonna work it out and we're all working together so i know one of the things that you would like to continue with if uh, given the opportunity is to make the meetings more accessible correct what what has happened of course with the flu and the pandemic and everything else, it, it forced uh, us to make some changes. And I think we and I had this conversation back in March or April and uh, we were doing all our phone, we were doing it on the phone and now we're doing it on the Zoom and every week it gets better and better. And uh, we get it out on our website and we're, we're, we're way ahead of the game. I, w I can't deny that we were probably forced into it because of the COVID, but it's here to stay and it'll only get better and more accessible uh, for all of the folks in Norfolk County. So uh, we won't be returning uh, to the old way. So uh, that that's a win-win for everyone. I think a lot of folks, Joe, don't know what the county commissioners well, do. Well, it's true. In the county, which is uh, started in 1793, it's been a long time around. The county is basically responsible for the administration of four or five very important areas. The first one is we're responsible for the administration of the six district courts and the one superior court that we have in downtown Dedham. We have uh, district courts, of course, in Quincy, as everyone knows. We have a district court in Stoughton. We have one in Brookline. We have one in Dedham, and we have one in Rentham. Secondly, we're responsible uh, for the management of uh, of the building that the Registry of Deeds is in. It also houses the grand jury and it houses a probation department. With a small engineering department where the county engineering department works in some of the smaller towns, assisting towns that don't have an engineering department or an engineer. We have our recreation facility, half in Quincy, half in Milton. So it's germane to the Quincy folks, the old Wallace and Golf Course now known as Presidents. It's a very busy facility, gets a lot of play, and we had a very slow start this year due to COVID, but we're having a very successful year. We're spending a lot of resources there upgrading the tennis courts, the parking lot, the signage. The last uh, and not least, but one of the most important, and I think the most important uh, facility we have is 
As a county commissioner, I'm a member of the school board of Norfolk County Agricultural School. 590 students down in beautiful setting in Walpole. It's uh, over 100 years old. It's a terrific uh, agricultural school. There's only two left in the state, ours in Bristol. And uh, we're very, very proud of the school. Of course, with all the COVID challenges, we have a lot of challenges. We're getting ready to go back to school. It's on the front page every, every day for every city and town. And we're working very hard. We're also uh, um, awaiting some state funding to fix several of the buildings there because it is a campus-type environment, and we own 35 acres there on Route 1A in Walpole. It's a beautiful place, and uh, the happiest time every year as a commissioner is when we go to graduation. About 125 students graduate every year and see those young people from all over the county. Probably there's 20 or 21 students from Quincy. 20 from Weymouth, 10 from Braintree, and it, it's it's really a a great, great facility, and uh, well, it's, it's, I know, it gives them some well-rounded background. I know that uh, solar programs, uh, you're looking correct. to implement those at the school, correct? Well, we are in the final stages of implementing, we hope, a solar program. It's interesting. It's really germane. You should bring it up tonight. The Walpole School, the Walpole Board of Selectmen is uh, taking up the solar question. We have to be transparent. We have to notify every one of our intentions. And tonight was the second night that uh, the county administrator and uh, our engineers are before the uh, Walpole Selectmen. I haven't heard the results, but we are going to have a solar field on our campus. We will not be able to see it from the neighborhood streets. It's going to be in the back and it's going to be fully uh, covered with uh, landscaping and everything. We're going to use that energy to defray the costs of electricity at the school. And we are, more importantly, going to teach solar to the young people there. It's going to become a part of the curriculum. So we're, it's green and it's new and we're very excited, but it probably won't be implemented till next September if we're fortunate enough to get the go ahead. But we're, we're following the general laws and we've been working on it for four years. So we're excited about it. And then people will not only help us pay the budget, it'll teach again the young people how to install solar and uh, it's a wave of the future. Joe, but, can uh, you talk a little bit about the actual makeup of the commission? There has to be representatives from all over the county, isn't that right? Correct. There are three elected county commissioners. No two commissioners can come from the same town. So that, that distributes it out. Two are running this year. Uh, Fran O'Brien, a longtime chairman, has stepped down or is stepping down, and there'll be a new commissioner elected this year, I hope, along with myself. So two will be elected this year. And then in two years, the other commissioner, who happens to be Peter Collins of Milton, runs in an, another cycle and then is elected. Again, no two commissioners can come from the same town. That way it spreads it out. Um, I'm you know, I'm Quincy, of course, and I'm happy to say there's been a county commissioner uh, from Quincy for well over 120 years. Well, it's a little distributed. Collins is Milton and O'Brien is, uh, of course, uh, a legend in Dedham and, and he takes part of that county. But the candidates are diverse this year. One, Charlie Ryan, of course, from Braintree, a candidate from Canton, very experienced, Richard Stady, and then uh, a Dedham selectman. Dennis Gilfoyle and myself running for two seats. So we'll uh, hopefully I will go on and one of the other three will go on to be on the ballot in November. Four year terms. And we work with the county treasurer, the registry of deeds, the county engineer and uh, the folks. Years ago, we had the probate and the, the DA and the sheriff, but they're now they're now state employees and we don't own or manage their facilities. And the budget's about 32 million a year. Uh, Quincy, of course, having the golf course mostly in Quincy and having Quincy District Court uh, is, a, is, a, is an important part of the county. It's the eastern end, more to speak, but uh, no. the, county, the county seat is in Dedham, and I believe uh, very historic there, very, very great historic setting. Those buildings are beautiful, and we're, we spent a lot of money trying to keep them up, and we're going to continue to do that. Well, now you mentioned Quincy District Court, and there's been talk about that building, potentially that court moving. 
Uh, any any information well, on that? Yeah, I do have some information. Um, we're working with the state. We own the building. We we police it. We we maintain it. We're, our custodians run the building, but the state runs the trial court system. <clears throat> I've been working with Mayor Koch and the other commissioners and the state. We have been told two things. There will be a new court built in Quincy. It's in this year's budget. It's going to be a 19 or 20 courtroom building. That's a big building. Present courtrooms only got seven buildings there, seven courtrooms, and it's 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 inadequate. It's in a great location in the square. I believe the state folks and their 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 architects and engineers want to remain there. So you're going to see a new state of the art building there. If I say a year, it'll be four or five, but. I would say within five years will be a new Quincy court. It will remain in Quincy. It won't leave the city of Quincy, but it's going to change because it's going to grow. And that's the second or third busiest district court in the whole Commonwealth. And of course, we all know the great programs that uh, go through the Quincy court. But let me tell you, it's one busy place. Joe, it's been so good to see you. And okay, well, I, you do a great job as usual. I miss everyone, but I mean, I'm, st I'm still around. It's a big county, and uh, we're very happy and uh, very thankful, of course, to the people from Quincy. Because, you know, when I travel into the the hinterlands in Norfolk County, everyone says, oh, yeah, you're that Quincy guy. You know, I said, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think well, I'm going to deny, that. but I don't deny I'm that Quincy guy. I happen I'm to know that. I'm very having, proud of it. You're having a hard time leaving the city clerk's office. I know you've been helping. Uh, Nicole. Yeah, well, I, I can't help this year because my name's on the ballot, but. Uh, Nicole does a great job. They're, they're well, they're well armed and well trained, and uh, there's a lot of changes. But mm -hmm. that's America. Well, thank you okay. very much, Joe. Thank you very much. We uh, will now, actually, as we uh, close, we will go to uh, Quincy City Clerk uh, Nicole Crispo and uh, the visit that uh, Joe, you and I were talking about earlier today when we met to talk about uh, the polls. And again, Quincy Access Television and Joe, of course, uh, you were not there as we had been in the past, but um, I asked Nicole to give us uh, insight as to what went on during election day today at the polls. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Quincy Access Television's At The Polls. Clearly we are not at the polls today, uh, but we will get poll insight with Quincy City Clerk, Nicole Crispo. Nicole is always welcome. How are you today? Great, how about yourself? A little busy, but good. We'll talk about that. Talk about uh, what uh, has happened today so far. We should mention to folks that we are recording this at uh, about midday. So talk about the activity at the polls. It's an absolutely gorgeous day to get out there and vote. Talk about that, but also talk about uh, early voting and how that uh, would impact uh, likely today. And of course, the mail-in voting as well. Sure. So um, we are having a great day today in our city. Um, all of our 31 precincts are open and we encourage people to go out and vote who haven't voted already. Um, there were so many opportunities here um, with the mail-in vote, the early vote, um, absentee vote, and again, in person to vote. Um, so I think people have taken advantage of all of the opportunities and whatever people feel most comfortable with during this pandemic, then, you know, I encourage them to use that avenue. Um, we are seeing good numbers at our polls. I thought it was going, you know, I, I, I did go out and say a little over 30%, 30 to 35% um, for a turnout. And I think that we'll be right on, if not a little, you know, on the high side. Um, people are turning out to vote at the polls. Uh, we, we are using um, all the proper precautions there. Um, so if anyone has any questions, they can certainly go to our website and see that what we're doing. Um, but we have, PPE and, and sanitation stations, and we are using wands to clean the pens 99%. 
um, UV light to clean the pens. And so I think that people are encouraged and our numbers are gone down in the city of Quincy and we are in the green. And I think that everybody is using, um, you know, the CDC guidelines and um, Health Commissioner Jones's recommendations. And of course, the reason why QATV isn't at the polls today was basically to make sure that uh, voters first obviously get to the polls and are able to vote because there is a, a limit, there is a capacity number that uh, I would assume you would have to stick by. Yes, and you know, to be honest with you, with the big turnout in the mail-in vote, um, I, I did not anticipate lines at the poll in place today. I just... I didn't see it. Um, have they had, you know, times that there's been a few people in there? Yes. The poll workers are doing a great job asking people to stand six feet away um, be between each other. And um, it's been going for complaints. No, I just missed a little bit about what you just said. Uh, so it's been going fine. Uh, the audio just uh, yeah, and just a second. The poll workers are doing a good job reminding people to stay six feet away from each other, keep a, um, a healthy distance, and uh, we haven't had any complaints today. And likely the precautions that uh, took place here today, are taking place here today, will continue for the general election come November. Yes, that's right. Yep, we will We will keep going this route and uh, and same with the mail-in vote and the early vote. As a matter of fact, you should be, if you haven't um, already filled out your card um, for a mail-in ballot, you'll get another chance to do that. Secretary Galvin is going to put out um, another whole mailing of cards for those that didn't do both elections. And you, so, you know, you have that option. And then uh, there'll be two weeks of early voting in October um, and always the absentee for those who utilize that. So if we could go over some deadlines for the upcoming general election. So folks that uh, certainly would like to vote and we do encourage everyone to vote, those that uh, do uh, give themselves that opportunity won't miss out. So what are some of the deadlines that folks need to be aware of? Uh, the last, um, the day for early voting starts, I believe it's October 17th, and that goes through October 30th. Um, and as soon as we, the, the, there is just a little lull in, in between the September and the November due to printing of the ballots. We got to be mindful that they're going to print ballots. Um, and as soon as we receive them, we'll get them out to those who have requested the ballot by mail. Um, and so um, every um, date is on our website at quinzyma.gov. There's a um, no before you go to the polls. Um, there are deadline dates for registering to vote. There are changing parties, changing address, things like that. Um, it's on our website and it's also on the mass.gov website. We should mention that QATV will be going live tonight at 8 p.m. Matter of fact, this piece will likely air within that uh, program, but we will not be giving out results because results will take some time to tally, correct? So we are tallying, um, we're processing, I should say, we're processing now. So uh, we do have central tabulation. I, I felt that it was important to keep the ballots that um, people have voted early and um, sort them here, process them here, and all that data gets stored. Um, and tonight at 8 p.m., when the, the data comes from the polling place, it gets joined with the data from early voting, and we should have those numbers tonight. Um, and then we'll, we have to go through, through things like uh, provisional ballots and um, and overseas ballots, but just be clear, 8 p.m. tonight is the deadline for bringing your ballot to City Hall or going to the polls and voting. Well said, because I think uh, people uh, 
my, some people might have been under the impression that they could mail their ballots in by today. That's not the case. If you have a ballot in hand, that really needs to be brought to the polling place, City Hall, correct? Not the polling place. If you do bring your ballot to the polling place, they can't accept it there. They can spoil it there and you can vote in person, but you can't just leave it there. Um, we do have to process it here before it goes out to the polls. So um, we encourage you to use the drop-off box in front of City Hall, which we have been um, emptying hourly, and, um, and we'll process those here and get them out to the polling place to run right through the tabulators today. Lastly, again, the procedure that will take place in November, as far as we know, as far as we can see, will be the same procedure that is taking place for the election today, correct? That's right, yes. And if anybody has any questions, concerns, please feel free to reach out to myself or the election department at 617-376-114443 and 42. Um, we're, we're here to help. Um, if you could, you know, there's calls coming in. So um, if you can be patient, we'll, we'll get to every one of them. Questions, concerns? Unfortunately, we're not, uh side by side at a polling location, but I do appreciate uh, you joining me for the new norm, if you will. Yes. In interviews. And, and I'd like to um, thank the poll, the staff at the, the poll workers that have come out today and that are taking every proper precaution to make sure that everyone that comes in to vote is safe and, and um, they're doing a great job. And I wanted to go ahead and thank my staff here who have worked countless hours um, on um, processing all these ballots and looking forward to November already. Very good. We'll leave it at that. Uh, Nicole, again, thank you for your time. And uh, we will touch base. I'm sure you will touch base with my colleague, uh, Joe Catalano, uh, a bit after the election day is through. So uh, once again, you and I will, will touch base prior to the general election again in November, November 3rd. Thanks again and uh, stay well. You too. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Well, that was at the polls without actually being at the polls. But uh, again, that was a conversation I had with the uh, Quincy City Clerk, Nicole Crispo, at about 2 p.m. today. Uh, Joe, as I mentioned, that, that basically wraps up our coverage here this evening. A lot of uh, guests, no numbers, uh, but uh, we said that from the onset that we wouldn't have that because of the scope of this particular race. Exactly. Yeah, just the way uh, the balloting happened, uh, four different ways to vote, really the early voting, the mail-in voting, the absentee balloting, and then, of course, today's in-person voting. So, uh, just uh, logistically, along with the pandemic, to try and get all the numbers together for this evening uh, just was not possible. However, it did allow us the opportunity to talk to a vast number of candidates uh, on the ballot, which was just fantastic. We thank uh, them for their participation. And of course, we do thank all the folks working behind the scenes uh, this evening uh, to be able to uh, help us bring you this coverage. Certainly, it couldn't be done without uh, the staff at Quincy Access Television. Everybody uh, was involved. All staff was involved tonight to put uh, on this production. Our executive director, Jonathan Caleri, uh, oversaw the whole process. As I had mentioned, uh, Christopher Potter, uh, Michael Jarvie, and Carol Themen were on board as well. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, uh, scheduling and, uh, and, and legwork that went into this uh, production. Uh, and uh, a really historic evening for us here at QA TV and the way we brought you election coverage. Certainly, we, we've done that here for many, many years, uh, but uh, due to the pandemic, uh, forced to do it a little differently. Uh, but also a first, uh, bringing it uh, live online uh, for uh, folks uh, watching over the Internet uh, as well. So some good, some bad. Well, we should also mention that uh, as we close, we'll, we'll be back here on November 3rd, uh, as it stands, as I had mentioned uh, and was speaking to Nicole Crispo about, uh, likely to, to basically fall under the same parameters, likely carry out the same as it did this evening. Absolutely. And uh, there'll be uh, more early voting leading up to the November uh, election. So we expect a much higher turnout uh, that evening. 
um, as well. But uh, Mark, I want to uh, thank you uh, and uh, all the folks uh, working behind the scenes and all folks watching uh, uh, this evening, either uh, on TV or, or online. We, uh, we appreciate all your support. Thank you.